Well, welcome or welcome back to everyone to the 2021 Fall Viscosity Summit. We are moving into our final presenter of the day, our very own Dr. Stacy Elliott. Before we dive into her presentation, I do want to give that final reminder that we encourage you to connect with us or follow us on social media. You connect, can connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter and connect with our team, ask any questions that you may have regarding anything that's been discussed today um, through any of our any of our speaker sessions. Now for this final session, if you do have questions, we encourage you to ask those in that chat panel, because again, for our last presenter, she has set aside time to answer those questions at the end. So just ask them as they come through and we will be more than happy to answer those for you. And now without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Stacy Elliott. She's the principal scientist at RioSense. Dr. Elliott obtained her extensive experience and rheological knowledge through her education at Carnegie Mellon University in Princeton, as well as her experience at both Alcon and DuPont. Today, Dr. Elliott will be presenting on tools of the trade, selecting the best viscometer for your application. And without further ado, I will turn the reins over to Dr. Stacey Elliott. Okay, thank you, Eden. Um, can you just confirm that you can see my presentation? Yes, I can see the presentation. Okay, great, thank you. All right, so um, I'm the last speaker of the day and uh, the talk is gonna be um, on the light side. We're not gonna have a lot of intense data like some of our earlier speakers had. My goal today was to really, you know, introduce, um, maybe some people out there that are joining us for the first time uh, to our technology, if it's new to you. And then also in that context, discuss, you know, how can you look at the problems you're trying to solve and the materials that you're working with um, and develop the right questions to ask so that you can select the appropriate uh, viscometer for you. Now, as I said, I'm gonna be focusing on our technology because that's, um, you know, the rheology world is very broad. And of course, this is our expertise. Um, so with that in mind, you know, as you know, there is generally, uh, things generally aren't a one size fits all. So there isn't, isn't going to be a single viscometer or rheometer that's going to be able to handle everything. You know, just like in, uh, you know, cooking, it's sort of a hobby of mine. And obviously, you know, you wouldn't have one knife to do everything. So, you know, you wouldn't carve your ham with your butter knife and try to butter your bread with your meat cleaver. Um, so you want to have the right tool for the job. And of course, you know, budget is also important to people. You know, sometimes you kind of have to make do. Uh, you know, I'm sure like when I was in college, I had a single knife that I did everything with and I survived. But, you know, now in my older years, I have the full set of tools. So um, just so you understand where uh, RioSense fits in into the world of rheology. So rheology is a fairly um, broad topic. Um, so the general, you know, definition of this is it's the specific, uh, science where the, the focus is on looking at how materials flow into form, a uh, very, a more concise way of thinking about this is what is a stress response generated, um, to a particular deformation that is applied. So in this case, you're going, you know, and the reality is broad because the, the fact of the matter is that you can have a variety of flow fields or types of deformations that lead to a variety of uh, stress distributions or stress response. So what defines the specific rheological property is referred to as this constitutive equation, which is relating these two things, the flow field and the stress or kinematics and dynamics and the very basic rheological properties. Um, now there are rheological properties that fall outside this basic definition, but many of the basic ones have this 
definition in common, and that is that there are a proportionality between the stress and the deformation. So uh, RioSense, or VROC technology, is really designed to handle steady shear and extensional viscosity measurements. So if your materials or your application really require that you are measuring, say, these um, storage and loss modulus, or you know, G G double prime, then this tool isn't going to be right for you. It's going to be uh, the very specific application of steady shear and extensional viscosity. So just to clarify how it is that we, we measure viscosity with the, the RioSense technology, um, as I stated, the general definition of a rheologic property is the stress as a, over the deformation. In the case of viscosity where you're dealing with fluid behavior, um, it's a continuous deformation or a rate of deformation rather than a finite, say, strain. And the type of uh, continuous deformation can be variable as can the stress response to this deformation. So under steady shear, you're getting a shear stress response. Under the extensional um, deformation, you're getting a normal stress response, more specifically a, a normal stress difference. And the Rio Sench approach uh, with the microfluidics to, uh, to be able to measure both of these types of viscosity is to make a modification to the flow channel geometry. So, um, our more common product is the uniform flow channel, uh, more commonly known. This is in, well, I mean, it's used in all of our instrumentation, as you'll see, but um, MVROC is, you know, probably one of the more popular instruments. Um, the uniform flow channel gives us the steady shear viscosity. And the EVROC, um, which is for the extensional type of a measurement, has in the center of the flow channel a hyperbolic contraction and expansion. And that's how we introduce that different type of deformation, which gives us the different type of stress response, uh, normal stress difference to get the extensional viscosity. So this is uh, our very specific focus here at RioSense. Um, so I think one of our earlier speakers pointed out to you a little bit more of the detail about our technology. Also, basically just saying, noting the combination of microfluidics and MEMS, where um, this is a controlled uh, rate or controlled strain type of rheometer where we're controlling the flow through the flow channel and we're measuring the pressure drop across the base of the flow channel. So basically controlling shear rate um, by controlling the flow rate and measuring the stress by measuring the pressure drop across the flow channel. And so this is how we calculate the, the um, steady shear viscosity for our systems. Um, there's a similar type of, I didn't want to go too much into it, there's a similar type of relationship when we're looking at the extensional properties as well, except in that case we're um, calculating an extensional rate based on the flow rate and the geometry parameters, and then we're calculating a normal stress difference based on the pressure drop across that uh, constriction in the center. Okay. So with that in mind, uh, that, that that is our uh, sort of overview of our technology, before I started discussing the specific products that we offer, I wanted to sort of put out there some sort of questions that are good to consider when you're trying to decide what instrumentation to purchase. Um, because, you know, as we talked about at the beginning, it's generally not a one-size-fits-all, and you want to assess your situation and then find what tool will work best for you. So. Some of these questions are gonna to relate to the sample details. So what are you working with? And then what are your measurement goals? What are you trying to achieve? And then both of those sort of in combination will sort of guide you towards what, what testing parameters are most relevant for you. And that's really gonna be um, sort of the, the metrics that you use to choose your instrumentation. Um, and this is actually true not just with our technology, but if you're, for example, searching for a rotational instrument and you have and you narrow these things down and you understand what testing parameters you need, you know, you can go and look at the, the tabulated information to make your selection. So it's this general, you know, thought process can work, you know, outside of our technology as well. Okay, so what when you thinking about your samples, these are some of the things that came to mind and these are um, specifically important to the microfluidic technology, and we'll sort of see why as we move along. I'm not going to, you know, 
cover examples for everything here. I just wanted to sort of introduce, you know, all of the things you might want to consider when you're thinking about the nature of your samples. So first and foremost, obvious, and this is quite obvious, I think, is what is the viscosity range of your samples? And, you know, of course, we don't necessarily expect that everyone is going to know the exact viscosity. Um, if you, you know, did, you wouldn't necessarily need to purchase our products or work with us. But I think, you know, most people can visually distinguish something that's uh, viscosity close to water versus something that has viscosity close to honey. And these are going to be orders, uh, orders of magnitude different in viscosity. So, so what are you dealing with? Is it, um, you know, very low viscosity or very high viscosity materials? Also, um, you know, how stable are your samples, um, both in terms of in a response to shear and then in a, in a response to um, time? Do, do they age or degrade just, uh, you know, uh, without any sort of external force. Um, and this, you know, we learned a little bit this morning from Bradley about how the shear, you know, did impact his particular um, cellulose nano nanocrystal uh, samples. So this is going to be something to think about. Also, what sort of volume do you have available? Um, you know, the one of the big features with our instrumentation is that, um, you know, independent of our specific instrument, the, the volume on, you know, on average is, is quite low, whereas you might need for certain tools on a rotational unit or even in, say, a capillary tube, like a ubulody tube, you know, tens of milliliters, you know, we're always in the, the, you know, max hundreds of microliter range. So what kind of volume do you have available? Also, do you need to recover your sample? Is this a precious sample or do you need to test this sample in another you know, analytical tool after exposing it to shear. So is recovery important to you? And then you want to think about sort of some complex features of your sample. Is your sample non-Newtonian? Does your sample have a yield stress? In other words, is it solid-like up into a particular stress after which it will start to flow? Um, does it uh, exhibit thixotropic behavior? Is there a time dependence um, after shearing? for the structure to rebuild and therefore the viscosity to return to its original state. Um, and then in terms of uh, the composition that you have, uh, one of the key things in uh, the microfluidics, and this is also actually important in any sort of rheological measurement because, you know, even though the microfluidic dimensions are significantly smaller than a lot of, a lot of the dimensions in the rotational units, um, you still have to consider these uh, the relative length scales of what's going on in your formulation versus the tool that you're using. So you want to think about, you know, what sort of size are any particles or aggregates or droplets in the case of an emulsion? How large are these and, and how rigid are they? And also if you have any sort of um, microphase separation or some kind of phase separation or any sort of inhomogeneity, what is the length scale of this? Because we want to compare these length scales um, to the length scale of our flow channel. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, why that's, why that's important. And then the other issue is, you, you know, what is this sample uh, or the components in the sample, what is their solubility? Because it's very important, the microfluidics to, you know, achieve quality data and maintain your instrument, it's extremely important to clean the system well. <clears throat> so you wanna understand what's in your samples and, you know, what, you know, could be a very effective way of, of cleaning. And then also, um, you know, certain formulations are intended to form films, and this can be a challenge. Uh, again, this is more related to the cleaning, not so much the testing. Um, and so you want to think about, because with the microfluidics, the cleaning is, you know, flushing the sample with uh, fluid at, you know, various rates. It's not like a tool that you can take off the rheometer and you know, scrub with something to remove a film. So you have to think about that mainly related to the cleaning. And then again, some material compatibility. So uh, I, I, that's less of an issue now that we've upgraded our automated instrument, but you know, in the past, certain instruments that we had weren't always compatible with certain organic uh, solvents. Okay, so these are some things to think about when you're trying to look at the types of samples that you're working with. And we'll bring up some of these points again later when we start looking at our instruments and some case studies about, you know, um, choosing the instrument. Okay, so then you want to think about, you know, what, what are your measurement goals? 
Um, and these can vary greatly. And the extent of the measurements that you will perform will depend on these goals. So it's, you know, we always like to talk about how valuable viscosity is and how beneficial it is to do a thorough analysis and characterization. But in reality, sometimes really all you need is a quick quality control or, you know, quick screening method um, to, to monitor some sort of process. Uh, so, you, you know, that's one way or one goal that you may have. Um, some people are try, trying to predict, you know, specific performance properties. They really want to know ahead of time based on a parameter, how will their product perform in, in the real life application. And then there are people who use uh, viscosity in a less practical way, more of, as an investigative tool, and they're just really looking to do a very thorough characterization and explore their sample. Maybe they want to um, um, models to their samples to extract, or models to their data rather, to extract some, you know, parameters about them. Um, you know, there's, there, this could be an interesting uh, thing for you also. And then some other things in terms of, you know, what's going to be important for you is, do you need some high throughput? Is automation important? Um, and, you know, in the case of something like a quick screen, uh, is portability going to be a benefit to you? So, you know, we tried to take our core technology and design products that would sort of address all of these different uh, needs that people might have. So then, you know, with that in mind, so now if you thought about what types of samples do you have, what are your measurement goals? Now this, you wanna focus in on knowing that, what sort of um, testing parameters are relevant to me based on these samples and my goals in terms of measurement. So, you know, as I sort of hinted at a moment ago, when you're dealing with something like quality control or a quick screen, usually it's adequate to establish a single point type measurement. Um, the only thing you want to do, though, is make sure when you choose your shear rate and your temperature, you want to be able to, you know, maximize any different differentiation that you're trying to see. Um, you know, so for example, if you think back to anyone who saw, say, um, Bradley's talk this morning, so he was looking at viscosity as a function of shear rate for a number of different concentrations of his um, uh, cellulose samples. And, you know, if you're trying to use viscosity as, say, a screening tool to look at, you know, variability and concentration, you wouldn't want to pick the highest rates that he operated at, because if you remember, those all sort of started to merge into a single viscosity close to the viscosity of water you'd probably want to then choose your shear rate to be at the lower end where you saw more uh, differences prior to extreme shear thinning. So, um, you know, even when you're selecting a single point, you want to, you know, think about what you're doing and, and you know, choose the best parameters that you can to, to achieve your goal there. Also then, um, if you're looking to try to predict how this particular material will perform for your spe specific application, um, again, you're, wanna, you're going to want to assess the situation and to the best of your ability, try to, you know, at least ballpark what are practical shear rates um, or extensional rates in the case of if you're looking for uh, extensional viscosity, you know, what are the, the best or most realistic values that I can extract or approximate from this? And, you know, that's, you know, quite doable in, in a you know, most applications. Also, you know, there was a lot of talk earlier um, in the most recent talk, the one we had just prior to me with, with the cannabis products, um, you know, storage and application temperatures are very important. So if it's been sitting in the car uh, versus, you know, in your pocket, something like this, um, you know, know the relevant conditions that you're trying to uh, simulate. And also processing conditions, and this is going to encompass both shear rate and temperature um, and this, again, can be quite variable. And then, you know, maybe sample aging. Do you want to think about, uh, you know, times? What sort of timing do you want in terms of your, your measurement? And this could be just time or it could actually be, uh, you know, degradation under shear, again, as we learned about this morning. Something with the thorough sample characterization or exp exploration, if that is your goal, 
then you'd want to choose some type of instrumentation that's going to give you the broadest range of shear rates and temperatures, just so that you have the ability to explore as you would like, when you would like. And then also perhaps, um, you know, if you're dealing with, you know, some of the common materials that our customers deal with, this could be also something where you do um, things like intrinsic viscosity, uh, which is just basically looking at a dilute uh, concentration series um, with your samples. So, you know, thinking about these things, you know, looking at what your goals are and what types of samples you are, you should be able to narrow down some more specific testing parameters that, or a range of testing parameters that, that could work for you. So I'm just gonna point out and be very clear that there are certain you know, samples that are going to be challenging for the microfluidic technology. So there are certain things that you know, probably aren't, this is probably not the most appropriate tool for you. So one of these is if you have a, say a high yield stress material, um, you know, and this is going to be a problem not only with testing and cleaning, but also loading into the, the syringe, uh, you know, so from the start, it could be very, very, very difficult. Now, the, the microfluidics can certainly handle materials that have a low to moderate uh, yield stress, uh, particularly when there's also a significant shear thinning accompanied uh, or that occurs rather after the yielding behavior, those are certainly doable. However, something you know, like a paste is, is just going to be very difficult, both in terms of testing and getting quality data and cleaning. I had mentioned earlier that you wanna think about what kind of particles and or sort of microstructure exists in your samples and think about what is the length scale of those. Because the general rule of thumb is that you don't want any of the, uh, Length scales associated with the, you know, particles or, say, phase separation, to be more than 10% of the channel depth. So our largest flow channel has a depth of 300 microns. So we're not going to want to try to work with anything um, larger than about 30 microns. Now, uh, there is a little flexibility there in terms of, you know, whether you have something that's hard sphere like and very rigid or do you have something that's you know softer and you know can be more easily deform and compress so you know a, a aggregate of colloidal particles hard sphere like particles versus an aggregate of proteins there's some more flexibility with the proteins because they can deform um, much more uh, whereas the hard spheres are, are quite rigid so there is a little flexibility there but you still need to be aware of of that as a, an issue. And then of course, if you have something that is extremely unstable under shear, but this is going to be true for really any type of instrumentation. You know, if you can't even load it without changing the nature of the material, then, um, then that's not going to be appropriate. Okay, so let's then move into, you know, our product line. And as I mentioned earlier, our entire product line has the same core technology. It's the microfluidics. Um, but we've developed three types of instruments to sort of address different customer needs. And, you know, I've sort of highlighted some of the main differences here with sort of ballpark estimates on some of the parameters because um, in some cases you, you can, you know, push the limits a bit. Um, so these are just meant to sort of guide and, and be a ballpark. So we have our microvisc, our MVROC, and our Initium One Plus now. We have a, a new automated, uh, fully automated model now referred to as the One Plus. So one of the things to point out is, you know, if, you know, sample volume that you have available is uh, an issue for you, then, you know, the instruments, you know, to get a quality measurement, uh, the minimum volume that you, need, you will need will depend on will change with the instrument, with our initium needing the least uh, minimum volume and our microvisc needing a little more. Now, again, these numbers are ballpark. I'm, I'm not saying you can't get any data if you have less than 100 microliters. It's just that um, you, you won't have the ability to do as many repeats or you know, maybe achieve the same quality that you would uh, be able to if you had the full 100 microliters. So bear in mind, these are ballpark numbers. So 
um, if you have you know really restricted volume then you know this is really going to be where you're going to want to move to if shear rates is very important to you um, if you're dealing with non-newtonian materials and you're dealing with some specific applications where you really need a particular range of rates then um, you know the our MVROC instrument actually has the broadest range of accessible shear rates um, from slightly less than one up to over one million. Um, sort of the next broadest range would be our initium, which goes from about 40 to almost 150,000 inverse seconds. And then our uh, microvisc uh, has the narrowest range going from about two to slightly less than 6,000 inverse seconds. So if shear rate isn't so important to you, then you know you wouldn't want to worry too much about this, but it, it may be. In terms of the max viscosity, um, again, the, the MB rock is going to be able to handle probably the highest uh, viscosity samples. And again, I've put sort of, uh, these are approximate because, you know, we've, you know, personally measured cannabis samples that were in the vicinity of 300,000 centipoise, but that's not a common practice. And I believe, you know, we've also measured, you know, cannabis samples approaching 100,000 in the microvisc, but this is a more conservative estimate. Now the initium the automated system is going to be a little more restrictive in terms of viscosity because uh, because of the nature of the loading from the auto sampler syringe and then also the ability to clean out the entire system. Um, cleaning out the Envy Rock or the microvisc, cleaning out a 300,000 centipoise sample out of these two units here is going to be much easier than trying to clean that sample out of the one plus. So we kind of conservative estimate of about 100,000 centipoise, but you know, we have you know, pushed this to the limit. We have measured things higher. Um, in terms of the temperature range, also there's some variability here. Um, the microvisc is going to only be from about 18 to 50 uh, degrees Celsius, whereas the MB rock and the initium are the 4 to 70 C. Uh, if you go to the high temperature system with the MB rock, then you can get into excess of 100 degrees Celsius. Um, I may have not the most current number, but uh, you can certainly get above, you know, 100 degrees C there. And then, of course, the, the microvisc is designed to be portable. It can be battery operated, and it has these disposable uh, pipettes that you use to load the sample. So this has a lot of convenience in that respect. And um, in terms of this dimensions of this this microvisc, it's not too much bigger than say a, a Kleenex box, um, or maybe it's even a little smaller. So it's easy to pick up. It's light. It's very portable. Whereas the other two, you're going to want to have some dedicated lab space to operate those. Um, automation is only available right now in our Initium One Plus. So if you know prepping the samples in the vial and then setting up the test and letting it go is very important to you, then you know that's going to be the option there. Um, again, in terms of uh, a sample retrieval feature, the Initium is the only model that has this right now. Um, by retrieval, I mean, you know, once we load this, you know, as little as 26 microliters, um, you can basically do infinite testing with that volume because once the test syringe is emptied, you can have a basically reverse flow and refill the test syringe again. Um, you just consist just continuously test that same volume over and over again. Um, whereas the other two instruments, uh, it's sort of a one-way path, um, and we go you know from the test syringe through the flow channel into the waste bin. So um, you know the only way to retest that sample is to get out of the waste and then move it, uh, put it back into a, a test uh, syringe, which is, is you know certainly doable, but not as convenient as it is in the automated setup. And then in terms of sample recovery, although technically you can, um, you know, recover sample from the waste bin of the microvisc or Envy rock, um, there is a formal recovery process in the Initium One Plus, where after everything is tested, we have a final retrieval, um, and then the auto sampler will remove the sample and replace it back into a vial. And then in terms of if you wanted to use uh, the flow channels that we're applying the extensional type of deformation to get that type of uh, viscosity measurement, then right now the Envy Rock is compatible with our extensional chip. 
However, we're you know in the process of getting ready to be able to use that one with our Initium One Plus as well. So uh, this is sort of the general overview. Um, so after you've sort of thought about your samples, thought about what are your measurement goals, and that has allowed you to identify the parameters that you want to work with, then you would go to a table such as this and try to see you know, what tool is the best one for you. Um, so let's, so, you know, there are many applications that our instruments are used in. It's very broad um, because they're, you know, fluids are such a, uh, you know, ubiquitous uh, material out in the world in industry. Um, so, you know, with, you know, all of these applications in mind, the, the final thing I wanted to do is really just pick, um, a few different sort of scenarios or case studies as I refer to them and sort of, you know, briefly outline a situation and then say, you know, based on this information, what, you know, we could possibly recommend to you as a, the best unit or instrument for the task. So for this, you know, first scenario, um, so if you have just, you know, this is, just imagine what you're trying to do is do some sort of quality control um, where you're preparing different batches of a formulation um, such that say the concentration can vary. Um, and you're doing this, these different batches uh, across multiple locations. And so, you know, and this could be like R&D, pilot lab, full-scale manufacturing, all trying to make the same formulation that can vary in concentration. So you wanna do some quality checks to see how things are comparing in these different um, groups. And so viscosity is going to be a good tool for looking at, you know, concentration variability, because um, if you remember both uh, Phil's talk, uh, but then also uh, Bradley's talk, they both talked about how their viscosity was highly dependent on, in Phil's case, the concentration of his monoclonal antibodies, and then in um, Bradley's case, the concentration of his uh, cellulose um, crystals or nanoparticles. So it's a good tool if you want to look at how variability in something like a, a concentration can change, um, change in these different environments. So what's going to be important in this scenario? So this is more like a quality control or quick screen type test. Um, likely a single point could be identified at a moderate shear rate, you know, it's not likely to be necessary to go to, you know, uh, a million excess of a million shear rate. So um, the, the, the parameters here could be likely single point and, and quite uh, moderate. Also, if you, um, you know, are trying to measure this in multiple areas, then it's going to be practical for um, the unit to be either portable or for it to be affordable so that you can have a unit in every lab and in manufacturing. So in this sort of scenario, uh, this is going to be something where something like the microvisc used in the, you know, with the battery powered, with the disposable pipettes, you know, could be maybe the best tool for the job. Um, now that doesn't mean actually that you can't use the other tools if, you know, you have the budget to do so um, and, you know, the lab space to do so, you know, because I'll, I'll admit there, you know, um, you know, working in the applications lab here, when I can use the automated system, I will always choose that over the others just because it's, uh, you know, faster and more, more convenient. Um, okay, so let's then move on to a second scenario where, you know, let's say that you have a different type of application now, maybe some sort of high speed coding application, and you're trying to lay down then some non Newtonian fluid and you want to predict, you know, either maybe the conditions of this process or, you know, how it will perform. So these high speed coding situations, these are going to be in some instances more extreme shear rates. So a million or perhaps in excess of a million, given that we're dealing with a non-Newtonian fluid, um, it's going to be very important to try to get close to the real shear rate or at least close enough that we could, you know, fit a model and maybe, you know, cautiously extrapolate. So it's good, going to be important to actually get close to a, a realistic shear rate um, when you're dealing with a non-Newtonian fluid. Whereas if you had something Newtonian, this wouldn't be so important. So in this instance, 
you know, the perhaps the Envy Rock is going to be the better tool because if you remember, this one has the ability to get to much higher shear rates than other of the other options and, you know, could be very, very valuable in predicting uh, what you need in this case. So then the final one um, is, you know, let's say you have, uh, you're in sort of early stage development of a product and I've, I've thrown out uh, antibody therapeutics because that's a very common uh, customer for us, but it really could be anything, any situation where you need to screen a lot of products and you don't have a lot of sample because you're, you know, in the early stages or perhaps these um, samples are quite costly, you know, whatever the reason is, you know, it's uh, this, I've gotten specific here, but you could sort of expand this and make it more broad. Um, so you're in the early stage development for say antibody therapeutics and you wanna do some high throughput screening. So early stage, um, as I mentioned, you know, implies that you may have limited volume. Um, so volume is going to be very important. And because you wanna do um, screening of say a lot of candidates in as quick, uh, as rapidly as possible, um, you know, it's going to be very important to screen as many candidates as you can, as fast as you can, but then also, um, you know, because the volume is low, you're going to want to be able to use that volume to get as much data as you possibly can. And so in this case, this is sort of an ideal scenario for using the automated system um, because it, it, it has the ability to work with less volume than the other two options. It has the retrieval feature um, so that you can maximize the amount of data that you get for that volume. It also has the recovery feature so that if you wanted to try to salvage that for some other testing, then it, it you know, automatically does that for you as well. Um, so that's just sort of the general overview then of our instrumentation and then sort of how I would recommend thinking about your samples and you know, your measurement goals and trying to see which, which instrumentation would be best for you. Of course, you know, once you've thought about everything, um, we're happy to talk to anyone about our technology and how it could help them. So you know, always please contact us. So I will stop there. And if there are any questions, we can address those. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Stacey. So we do have a few questions um, that have come in. And one did come in during your presentation, but maybe in regards to the last, but I'll ask you anyways, um, if you know. For cannabis oils. So I guess, uh, Eden, since I can see the qu questions, I can just go ahead and address them. Do you want to read them out loud as well? Stacey, do you want to just read them out loud? Okay, so one of the questions here that we have <clears throat> is, you know, asking about one of the, let me quickly read here and then I'll summarize. Okay, um, so the question is the, let me actually um, go back to this previous slide. So the question relates to the, the solvent bottles on the um, side of the initium here. Um, and, you know, what, one thing that I did, one of our products that I didn't mention was the um, chip cleaning station, which is really only applicable for the uh, micro visc and the MB rock because there is no automatic way of cleaning those. Those have to be cleaned um, by loading the cleaning solvent in the test syringe and going through the process similar to um, how you would do the testing. Um, so uh, the chip cleaning station can be useful for the micro visc and the MB rock. And the question here is, is there some sort of chip cleaning option attached to the device? So the when I, I guess I didn't elaborate too clearly on the nature of the automation here, but the automation is starts with everything from the loading of the samples, the measurement of the samples, and then the both cleaning of the auto sampler and cleaning of the entire system. So 
Um, the answer to the question is yes, that's sort of factored into the instrumentation where, um, you know, it, it does everything for you in terms of cleaning, loading, and all cleaning and all measurements. So yes, there is uh, built into the system uh, cleaning of all, all components. So Stacy, there was a question that came in earlier today that goes perfectly with your presentation. Um, it says, how do you calibrate the instrument? So there is a question that's sort of related to, I think maybe the, um, I'm not sure if it's, uh, should have been directed towards the previous talk or, or not, um, but it's related to cleaning out the cannabis oils from the, the microfluidics. Um, can you use 99% uh, isopropyl alcohol or ethanol to clean the V-Rock? And uh, yes, um, I don't remember specifically specific solvents that we used, but it certainly contained, um, it included, the series of solvents certainly included the, the alcohol. So the, yes, that does clean out cannabis. Stacey, are you able to hear me? Stacy. Oh, so I just got a message from Grace asking if I can hear her and no, I can't hear anybody. So um, I don't know what happened. Okay, I, I guess I can hear now. Stacy, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear now. Okay, perfect. Um, there's a question that came in earlier today that fits perfectly with what you're presenting on. And so the question that came in this morning was, how do you calibrate the instruments and minimize errors in the results, especially at high shear rates or concentrations? Okay, so... Um... Essentially, the instruments are calibrated internally. So when it's shipped to you, um, the flow channel will have been calibrated, both in terms of pressure and, and the, the channel depth. Um, so it's ready to go. The only thing sort of recommended that the customer do is sort of monitor that calibration status. Um, and then also in the process of doing that, you're also going to be checking to make sure um, you know, the chip is properly cleaned and not having any buildup or, or clogging. Um, and you would do that by using a NIST uh, traceable um, viscosity standard. Um, and so then that, 
you know, is how you're going to know your chip is functioning properly. And then could you repeat the part about the high shear rates? It was just especially when measuring at high shear rates or high concentrations. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's basically the, the um, procedure that you would do. You'd want to measure the, the Newtonian standard at over a range of shear rates such, such that it spanned the, um, the pressure range that you can handle. So from about five to close to 100% full scale pressure. Um, and that would be um, adequate to know that everything was functioning well. So did I answer everything, every part of that? Yeah. Well, I would say if no one else has any questions for Dr. Um, I, one came in. Um, sorry. No, oh, perfect. <laughs> um, so the question relates to um, they were saying that it's not clear whether the instrument has a temperature control system. Can you heat samples or main temperature conditions? Um, so the answer is that all of them um, have the ability to have temperature control. You can choose to use it or not. Um, so, sort of gone back to the, the slide with the table here. So, if you choose to use the temperature control, which they all have the option for, um, then you, you have a slightly different range of temperatures that you can achieve for each instrument. So, yes, temperature control is available if that's important to you. So I think that may have been the last one, Eden. Perfect. So if no one else has any questions for Dr. Elliott, I just want to say thank you to everyone for attending our 2021 Fall Viscosity Summit. I would like to thank Dr. Elliott as well as all of our other speakers today for such wonderful presentations and answering questions. Uh, I Final reminder that recordings from today will be sent out after the conclusion of the event. And if anyone does have any questions that arise after, please don't hesitate to reach out to our team. You can contact us via our website or the emails and information that have been provided as well as on LinkedIn or Twitter via our company pages. And we're happy to connect with you and answer any questions that you have. So thank you all for coming and enjoy the rest of your afternoon or evening. Thank you again, Stacy. Thank you.